Go ahead. Could you advance him from the back, please, as he goes for it? Okay, so um, I don't know, maybe you wonder what my name, where my name comes from. My name comes from a, a little town in the north of Holland. So, okay, next, please. This is my disclosure. Next, please. Okay, what's interesting to know is that the um, bariatric procedures in Belgium have shifted from being first 100% of adjustable bands. Next, please. Uh, starting 2004, people started uh, performing laparoscopic rural wire gastric bypass, and about uh, the beginning of 2007, um, bypass became actually more popular this than. Right here. Right. It's a Mac. Right. It's coming off the Mac. Oh, okay, because mine is a PC. Okay. All right. Um, became more popular than <coughs> gastric bypass, but you see that the law changed in Belgium. And actually what changed was that the indications, which used to be the uh, normal NIH uh, criteria, became more strict. And for instance, people that have diabetes and do not have a BMI of 40 do not deserve a bariatric procedure in Belgium. So that's why the numbers dropped as of October 2007. However, at the main, <coughs> at the main time what we see is that um, also beginning 2004, the sleeve gastrectomy became more and more popular. And actually, this is the last figures are in 2008. But you see that by 2008, 5,000 people in Belgium benefited from a laparoscopic sleeve gastrectomy, whereas the numbers of bypass and band dropped. And when you look at the total, you see that because of the law, the total number of bariatric procedures um, went down but you see that there's still a sharp rise here of laparoscopic sleeve gastrectomy. Now, we started doing bands in uh, Brussels back in 1992. It's Guy Bernard who was the first one who performed laparoscopic band gastroplasty. And so we decided uh, to call back all the patients that we operated on starting in 1995, <clears throat> which means that we have an evaluation at more than 12 years uh, with the same band, which is the regular lap band. And the conclusion was, unfortunately, that we just quit doing it. So we no longer perform laparoscopic band gastroplasty in Brussels. And I must say, most people in Belgium uh, follow the same attitude. Now, when we look at our results of patients that were operated on 12 years and more, we could track down 82 patients, and we saw that the failure rate in these 82 was just about 50%, according to Reynolds' criteria. And what happened to those patients? Many of them lost their bands and refused to have another procedure, or patients went on to get another procedure because their weight loss was insufficient, or because they developed side effects to their band, which uh, could not be managed with another way than by taking out the band. When we look in the literature, and we try to dig out most of the significant papers concerning the long-term results of the band gastroplasty, we're here, okay? With our 82 patients, we see that we have a median follow-up of 13 years, and look at that, we have an erosion rate of 30%, compare that to the others. We have a power dilation rate of more than 10%, and our weight loss is about 40% excess weight, which is not too good, is it? When we look at the evolution of the BMI after band, again, over time, we see that the graph pretty much goes down in, in a normal direction, and you see that after 12 years, we're just about at the level of 33%. However, you see that this outliers when we try to analyze uh, this um, tendency, we see that many of the patients lost their band and regained weight. And you see that the band went out usually after three years or even more. Patients then either get a bypass and then their weight loss became acceptable again, 
or they just decided not to do anything, and of course they put on more weight. However, when we question those patients, again after more than 12 years, and we ask them how they feel after the band procedure, we see that the average result is three in Barrow scale, which means that most patients are pretty much feeling okay and happy about their procedure, which is a little bit odd uh, uh, if you consider the results that, that I just mentioned. So as I said, we have a failure rate of about 50%. How can we explain that? What did we do wrong? When we see at uh, our results, I just mentioned that we have, out of a number of 151, we only could trace down 82%, 80%, 80 patients, which means uh, just about 50%. And when we look at the number of times that we saw those patients in the office, we see that the average was just about four times, which is far too little, far too uh, few uh, visits to the office in order to have good results. Because we know from literature that maybe not in bypass, but in gastric bands, patients' follow-up plays a very significant role. And this was confirmed in other studies already a few years ago, and more recently as well. So we know that we need to see our patients often after band, otherwise they don't do well. Now the problem is that in Belgium, when we see a patient, we analyzed the length of time that that took in the office, it's about 12 minutes. And for that we get a reward of $20. So that means that per hour we get $100 for seeing our patients in the office. And maybe that's one of the reasons why we don't see our patients that often. Now, if you look at the reasons why the band didn't work in Belgium, at least in our institution, we see there's two big families. The first one is actually complications, band intolerance, GERD and band erosion, or weight loss issues. And then we will just quickly mention the sweet eating and super obese uh, categories. If you look at the first group, the patients who develop band intolerance, which, who develop <coughs> power dilation or esophageal dilation or GERD, we believe that's one big family, we will try to analyze why this happened and how this could have been avoided. Kadier and I, back in 2007, we tried probably in a bar, we tried to um, analyze what the conditions were to obtain a good restrictive procedure. And we came to the conclusion that, of course, we needed compartments. We needed to have a gastric compartment contained between an inlet and an outlet in order to, for the patient to experience satiety. And therefore, in a normal positioning of the gastric band, we see that the gastric band is positioned here, pretty much vertically on the x-ray, and we see that the pouch is rather small. This is the artist's impression of it and the passage to the gastric uh, uh, body is sufficient. We know that, especially in Austria and also uh, Neuville in Belgium, place their bands very high without really having a pouch. It's no longer a virtual pouch, there's no pouch at all. And to us, this is not a good uh, philosophy because then, of course, we have only one big compartment proximal to the pouch, due to the band, which is actually the uh, esophagus. Now this is um, a simple tape to show you how we place a band. We, we do place a band around a uh, gastric tube with an inflated band, with an inflated balloon at 15 cc. So we do have a small pouch here, no, no larger than 15 cc. I think that's important. Now unfortunately there's this law of Laplace. And you know that Laplace's law says that the tension across the wall of a sphere, the sphere of the, of, the, of the stomach, is right dependent on the radius of the circle over the sphere, which means that the larger the sphere, the larger the tension across its wall. And if we imagine what happens when we overinflate the outlet, we see that this pouch here dilates. Unfortunately, it doesn't work. This is supposed to dilate, but it doesn't. Okay, whatever. Okay. And we're all familiar 
too familiar with this aspect of a dilated pouch. Sometimes people call it the slippage. I'm not capable, and I think, no, don't think anybody in Brussels is capable of saying that this is either a slippage or a dilation of the pouch. The fact is that there's a competent inlet, there's an overtight outlet, and therefore there's a dilation. This is what it looks like on an X-ray, and the typical aspect of the band, which no longer is vertical, but is now horizontal, and the air fluid level in the gastric pouch. Sometimes, however, and this won't work either, of course, we see that not only the pouch dilates, but also the inlet. And this is supposed to dilate and to form one big system. And this is what it looks like on an x-ray. This is a, a patient who developed massive esophageal dilation. And why was that? It was because the inlet here is no longer sufficient. And the reason for that, if you look carefully, you see that the staples here. This was actually a patient who had a VBG and in whom we transformed his uh, anatomy into a gastric band anatomy. And now when we talk about banding um, gastric bypasses, just beware of a situation like this. So therefore, I think the conclusion is that it's really imperative not to inflate the band too much. And we're all familiar now with the so-called green zone that was developed by the company, where we see that the right amount of fluids means that the patient feels satiety, eats small portions, is not hungry, whereas when you inflate the band too much, you put too much fluid in there, you see that the patient is forced into poor choices of food, he regurgitates, there's discomfort, poor weight loss, and the regurgitation can even create a night cough. So, but this is not only for the lab band, because we analyzed, a while ago, we analyzed uh, the patients who benefited from a sleeve hysterectomy. And in the beginning, we had very good results, much better than with the band. But when you look at the evolution of those results here at six years, we see that when you look at the number of patients that had an excess weight loss of more than 50%, this went down dramatically. And after six years, we see that only 18% out of the 46 still have a sufficient weight loss. And this goes together with the development of a very poor choice of food cells. Patients become grazers or become sweet eaters, and this is the reason why they put on weight. And again, when you want to redo a procedure, like a band or a bypass, just listen to your patients. When you hear that there's sweet eating or grazing, maybe additional restriction will not be too beneficial. The second big family of problems that we encountered and where, why we had to remove the bands is band erosions. As I mentioned in our study, this, uh, that, will be, that is actually being submitted to the annals, we see that one out of the three patients developed band erosion. And this is an incredibly high figure, and we know that. And what is the reason? Maybe it is because we are poor surgeons, probably. But also, what we did is that when we called back the patients after 12 years and more, we scoped them all, with or without symptoms. And that's how we made a diagnosis of band erosion. And interestingly, 80% of the patients with band erosion had no symptoms. No weight gain, no symptoms whatsoever. The answer to that is probably that it could be avoided, as uh, Di Lorenzo in his large study of 2,000 so many patients pointed out, the best way to avoid it is probably the parse flaccid technique and, of course, the use of low-pressure bands. But don't think, though, that the parse flaccid will solve all problems because we know that uh, in Innsbruck, for instance, where they have a, a huge experience with bands as well, but they used the uh, Swedish bands, they used the parse flaccid from the beginning. And they also have an erosion rate of about 20% when you look actively for that erosion. The third reason why we would want to get rid of the band is patients who do not lose sufficient weight. And of course, everybody says then, yeah, but probably you didn't choose your patients right. And you shouldn't have operated on sweet eaters, and not on super obese, which we did. But then we know in the literature that sweet eaters apparently do just as well with the band in other countries than in Belgium, as was uh, published in Italy and in Australia. And we also know that the super obese patients do well with their band, uh, according to the literature. 
and that there's absolutely no worse results in super obese patients than in normally obese patients. So therefore, I think we can conclude that if we want to do a gastric band in 2010, we have to use the modern band, the low pressure band. We have to use the parse flaccid technique. We have to make a pouch as small as possible, but there must be a pouch. And most importantly, we do not want to inflate the band too much. We want to stay into the green zone. But I think all this is very important, but the most, and the very most important thing is, we don't think you have to attempt a gastric band if you cannot guarantee adequate follow-up, which unfortunately we cannot guarantee in Belgium. Thank you very much.